This session is called Strategies on How to Embed Inclusive Innovation in Design. TD's Digital Accessibility and Enterprise Innovation Team will share tactics to ensure that inclusive innovation and digital accessibility are centered throughout the ideation, design, development, and deployment process, not just as checklist items. Representing TD are Brian Moore and Sam Estoesta. I'm gonna turn it over to Sam now. Hi everyone, thank you for joining our session today. Uh, my name is Sam Estoesta. I am a product owner in TD Invent and I focus on inclusive innovations. Hi there, I'm Brian Moore and I work on TD's digital accessibility team, ensuring that our customer facing apps and websites create gr good user experience for everyone. Before I toss it over to Brian to start on the first half of our presentation, I'm just gonna go through our agenda. We've got a really packed agenda today. Um, we're gonna cover a, a significant amount of work, including uh, the 2080 rule, how to involve P uh, P P PWDs, persons with disabilities, um, looking at root causes, um, and then also some case studies on how we've interacted and, and, and integrated this work into what we're doing at TD along with some things that you can actually steal uh, and use by yourself. Um, and right before we get started, we do have this presentation online, so you can go to bit.ly slash td underscore csun, and there is also a QR code that you can take a screen grab of here to have access to our presentation as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. And just an FYI, those, those bit.ly links I discovered this morning are case sensitive. So if you don't do the capitals, it won't work. Um, all right, so we wanna talk about sort of how to be very intentional about including people that we don't see traditionally in innovation. So <clears throat> traditionally, innovation is driven by a business need. Um, I work in a digital space, so mostly we're talking about uh, things with the UI, whether it's an app or a, a website or some new product, but it, typically those are driven by the need to solve a business problem, mitigate a risk, things like that. Um, and it tends to be driven by a large, a typical user. So being inclusive in your innovation is a very intentional process. It won't happen by accident. Um, and when you're going to do that, you need to start with things like mission statements. So we have a couple of mission statements that we've used in this um, type of thing. And the first one is that everyone has a right to accessible banking. And that seems self-evident to us, but not necessarily to everybody. Um, and the other one is that we want to create an experience that's inclusive, you know, for everybody and reflects their experiences, motivations, and challenges. Um, if we could move on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we said, talked in the agenda about something called the 80-20 rule. And this essentially is that typically um, when traditional innovation happens. We're designing for approximately 80% of the users who are typical in some way, they, whether that's disability, whether that's race, whether that's gender, uh, a whole bunch of other cultural factors. And approximately, there's research on this, that about 20% of people who exist don't tend to get included in innovation. So we have to very intentionally put people with disabilities in the center of our design. <laughs> um, when we start with an innovation, we have to be inclusive right from the beginning. If, if we sort of come up with the solution and then think, oh yeah, we better check the inclusivity, it's not going to work. That's a backwards process. You know, that theme that we always talk about, shift left, um, very much applies here too. That people need to be included right from the start because we may come up with a solution that's very different than what, for example, the business thinks we need if we actually design for users. Um, <coughs> could we go on to? Yes. 
So the first thing we have to do is get buy-in from our leadership of the particular business that we want to actually create an inclusive design that will be useful and feel welcoming, more importantly, to all our users. And like I said, this is a very intentional step. So we want to include people with disabilities as stakeholders. And we can do that uh, to some extent with internal people, like if there are employee resource groups or that kind of thing. Or <coughs> sometimes what I've been involved in is where a design team will seek volunteers internally. Uh, but it's also important to exclude external users. Um, and we want to, because they won't be experts. And as we've learned doing re user research, sometimes we get very different perspectives from people who aren't inter, you know, embedded in this stuff every day. <laughs> so what we want to do is move from user-centered design where you know, the users are sort of consulted on something that's already built to, to co-design where the users are participating in the builds and the ide ideation to <coughs> inclusive design where the actual users are driving what we're going to come up with. Um, so we want, like I said, we want pe uh, disabled people as part of your design. Um, the other thing is we have to create a safe space, right? So traditionally in businesses, people who are sort of insiders will feel like they are kind of in control and people who are from outside may not feel like they're empowered to make comments or say things or, or be free with their thoughts and experiences. And those may be experiences that we're at all, not at all familiar with. So they could be super valuable. So we need to create a safe space for people to be free to express their views, their opinions, and Sam will dig into the methodology for that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, can we go on to root causes? Sorry, I'm gonna have to speed up a bit because <laughs> you're taking too much time. I'm a bit passionate about this stuff. <clears throat> so when we're designing, we have to look at what are we actually trying to design for? What is the issue um, or the root cause that we're, that we're trying to solve? Is it, you know, oh, we have to create some interface based on a regulation, but what can we do that will actually provide a better experience for our users? Um, and it's for us who are professionals in this stuff, sometimes tricky to unlearn our biases and our sort of habits that we've learned working in this space for a really long time. Um, let's go on to celebrate. Yes. So one of the really important pieces of this is when you get a design or a product or a service that's, that's finally out there, really celebrate that you have done a great job of building something that your users will be excited about. Um, this drives a whole bunch of customer loyalty. If people feel like they are a participant in services, products, UIs that are created for them, this is going to create a ton of brand loyalty and you'll get all kinds of free publicity because people will talk about, hey, I was involved in doing this. Um, I better stop talking because I went longer than I expected to, but I will pass it over to Sam for a bit and then we'll come back to some questions. Perfect. Uh, so as Brian was mentioning, we have some case studies on how we've actually done this work. So uh, the first one that we're going to talk about is uh, the TD Accessibility Adapter. And um, if you are uh, interested in downloading and seeing the tool itself, uh, it is bit.ly slash td uppercase underscore uppercase aa. Um, thank you for the, the captioning call out there, Brian. Um, for the td accessibility adapter, this is a browser extension that enables core accessibility functions on any website. But more importantly, it was designed by colleagues with disabilities, including some that haven't even publicly disclosed. 
and it was built for colleagues with disabilities. Um, our teams worked incredibly close with Brian's team on the digital accessibility team, our assistive technologies team. Um, we utilized our persons with disabilities employee resource groups. We all were looking to ensure that the extension would not create additional accessibility barriers. And this was all based on the feedback that our own employees had as they were uh, using, utilizing other web-based tools and understanding what worked for them and what didn't work for them. Um, and we also saw that when we were getting fantastic feedback from our own uh, employees that we didn't want to hide this or keep it as an enterprise level solution. Um, there, are, it, it's, you know, Brian and I work for an organization with 95,000 plus employees. We are, there are resources that are available to us as a large enterprise um, and we're able to build tools like this. But we know that there's some people who there are, are significant barriers to access uh, assistive technologies, and so we wanted to make this available at no cost to the public. Um, that, that's just one way of looking at understanding the, the core barriers at work that individuals are having, that they're sharing with their own groups, and then building something um, with a group of individuals with those lived experiences to ensure that it's not going to interact in a way that actually adds those additional barriers. And we actually have a quick video on it that we're gonna go ahead and share in the next slide and I will go ahead and play it. At TD, our purpose is to enrich the lives of our customers, colleagues, and communities. That's why, through TD Invent, we created the TD Accessibility Adapter, which is available to anyone at no cost. With one click, the TD Accessibility Adapter can help make the websites you visit easier to focus with a line-by-line -line reading guide. Easier to read, with a typeface option that can help you better distinguish each letter. Easier to see, with a customizable font size and font spacing. Easier on your eyes, with options to adjust color saturation, contrast, and monochrome. And easier to concentrate without distraction. And if you use assistive technology web tools, the TD Accessibility Adapter has been designed to work alongside them so you can continue to use the tools you're accustomed to. We all want to live in a world that's just a little bit easier to navigate. Why not start with your online spaces? At TD, our purpose is to... There we go. Um, and the other thing too that's really interesting here is that we haven't done this with just one group. We're doing this work across the work that we're doing in inclusive innovation. And the second one that I wanted to talk to you today is actually about the Tamarack Institute. Uh, the Tamarack Institute is an organization that is uh, represented in Canada and the US, and it focuses on a goal of eradicating poverty. Um, and so with this particular group, we've actually created a working group with individuals with lived experiences of poverty um, to build banking solutions that address their needs. And so this is a really fantastic co-design model that we're utilizing here. We had to do significant pre-training. All of the individuals from TD that were involved in this working group had to go through psychologically safe um, user testing training to make sure that when we were actually interacting with this working group that we were eradicating as many biases that we brought to the table when we were having these conversations. We also built a charter of how we work together, what feels like we're doing this in a good way. We had to look at the systemic issue of paying people for their labor and how that can affect their government subsidies. Um, Brian and I are both from Canada, and uh, so we have to think about how that would uh, interact with someone who is on um, some of those subsidies that are both provincial and federally um, given. We needed to think about meeting design. Uh, if you are working in an enterprise, you're used to a lot of 30-minute meetings where you have to get a lot done, and uh, there's not a lot of consensus building in, in a way that we think about a 30-minute meeting. But we actually had to extend our meetings to make sure that we built in time for consensus building. Um, and that meant that we were going to have a lot of collaborative conversations. And so how do you actually set up that space for deep explorations of a problem in a way that people are able to share and feel safe enough to share those experiences? So it is linked in the presentation, but there's a really fantastic um, team charter workshop 
Um, it, it, this is based on the Team, Canvas, or the Team Canvas Basic, which is a strategic framework that helps team members kick off projects and align on a co um, common vision. This is essentially what we utilize, and I would highly suggest that everyone else thinks about using a team charter as you begin your co-design work. There are some key areas of the, of the charter workshop that we utilize. A section on people. Who are the people on the team? What are the roles? Uh, what are the values that people have? What do they stand for? What are the common values that everyone uh, is there that we want to put at the, play, at the core of our shared work? What is our purpose as a team, as a, as a co-design working group? What's our purpose? What are the principles that guide our work? And then my favorite section is agreement. What do we agree we should always do? And what should we never do? Um, and this is also a really great place to discuss conflict management styles. We knew that there was going to be uh, some very hard truths that were going to be shared. The other thing too is that even though we had built as much of a non-hierarchical format as possible, we knew that the individuals at TD had relational power to the others on the working group. And so how do we build that into the way that we think about agreement? <laughs> We have a lot of resources that are available on this work um, that are all in the PowerPoint, um, and we didn't want to spend too much time because I think there's a lot of really helpful questions that we can go through afterwards here. Um, but you can have access to a Medium article or the Team Charter workshop that we discussed. We have our Equity Resource Hub. Um, our Equity Resource Hub is actually a public version of our inclusive innovation framework. Um, you can go to equityresourcehub.com. It will be available for you there. That shows how we actually think about our processes. We have things like our equity considerations, which are questions for us to consider as we're moving through our work, all the way through our inclusive personas. Um, some of the resources and methods that we utilize in our work include equity X design and liberatory design thinking, um, which you'll see there. And then also our TD Invent page. Brian and I are both part of the, the larger TD Invent group over in TD, and there's actually a really fantastic story about Brian, which is the first link here. Um, so if you have time when you're going through the presentation, feel free to go through this. Um, if there are only three things you take away from our conversation today, the first is that we need to stop thinking about inclusion after we create a concept or design. The second is that we don't need to just treat symptoms or jump to solutioning, but focus on understanding those root causes. In the Tamarack example, we actually did a full year of deep listening. We didn't do any solutioning or ideation until year two of that partnership because we wanted to spend so much time understanding the problem space and making sure that we really got to the root causes. And the last thing is to move from user-centered design to co-design to user-created design. And so th having that idea of actually going towards having individuals that not only are on your teams, but are building the solutions for their own communities. And with that, I'll leave it for some questions. Um, this is the QR code again that you can scan for the presentation. We also have that bit.ly slash in capital letters TD underscore capital letters CSUN, CSUN. Or you can also um, shoot Brian and myself an email. We're happy to answer any questions. <laughs>